Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Effed Up Stories. I am your host, Will Pender. And I am your co-host, Ryan Sharp. And tonight we will be doing another fan-submitted story. This time, um, very interesting, a underwater UFO. Now, this is not the first time that I've come across these stories, but it's very interesting because it's very rare. So we're going to be covering that story. Um, but before we do, we do have a little bit of news for you all. Um, as you know, we haven't had a show for a little bit, and that's probably all my fault. I'm still sinking into my role as a dad. Uh, but we do have some really cool stuff coming up for Halloween. We know that that's the, you know, the big one for us every year. So we have some really cool uh, shows planned for that. And uh, also, uh, many of you are on the f Up Stories uh, Facebook, right? Well, two things about that. Number one, Ryan, when he set it up, didn't set it up right. So he got to set up as an individual. First I am a up. Facebook noob. I'm an old man. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that because I'm not a big Facebooker myself. But that being said, I did set up a proper one. And I'm going to ask you all to join over there where we're having a new contest. And this, you know, this was really brought to me by uh, one of our fans, Hunter Forrest. Um, what I started doing was making these f up stories memes, um, which were really funny. And then uh, there were a couple others that joined in, uh, Mary Still and Daniel Luce. So they were really humorous to us. So we thought, hey, let's have a f up stories meme contest on this new uh, f up stories Facebook. And uh, we'll pick a, a winner, whoever we find does the funniest meme or the best meme or whatever. And we will give you guys some free stuff. Um, so yeah, that that's our plan. So if you're interested in doing that, then look up the uh, new F Up Stories Facebook page on Facebook. And uh, of course, if you have an F Up Story and want to get it into a podcast, you can do that at the official site, fupstories.com. That's e f f e d u p s t o r i e s dot com. And yeah, we will get it on the site and into a podcast. Now, with that being said. We're going to jump into our topic of tonight uh, on underwater UFOs. Now, this was submitted to me by John, a USO. Unidentified submerged object. An unidentified submerged object. So this was sent in by uh, John Thompson, and he actually sent this uh, September 2nd, 2015. So um, over a year ago, (laughs) but uh, it always kind of stuck in my head. So when I was flicking through stories to do... um, I kind of remember this one, and when I saw the title, I was like, fuck it, we're going to do that one. So, from the words of John, My effed up story begins back in the year 2012. I had just gotten out of high school, and things were pretty much the same old, same old. And I get this, it's a boring start, but it does get better. And he, you know, makes that promise. So, at this time, he was dating this girl, a fictitious name, Madeline. And she had a brother who at the time worked uh, second shift at the shipyard where submarines were built and they were kept for the U.S. Navy. Now, this place is nearly an hour outside the town where he lives. So by the, you know, the mid-July of the year, um, it was Friday and, you know, she went to pick up this guy from his work. So um, anyway, John tag along because... You know, he was shotgun, had no real choice. But this is where the story begins to get effed up. So by the time they arrived, it was a half hour before closing time, and they had to wait for her brother, you know, to finish up a shift. And fictitiously, we're going to call him Chris from this point on. And Chris was a janitor there. And in order for both... Uh, John and the girl to uh, his girlfriend to, to get in um, or it's not his girlfriend what the fuck am I saying I fucked up what was her name at the time no no, no it was his girlfriend Madeline that's right that was his brother I didn't fuck up but I fucked up saying I fucked up okay <laughs> alright so <laughs> Chris <laughs> um, he's John is dating Madeline and she has a brother Chris they're gone to pick him up okay and he's a janitor at this place so anyway uh, to get into this place, they had to have a visitor's pass, you know, which she had, which makes sense because this is a place where they keep military, sh- uh, you know, ships or whatever. So anyway, uh, this was a requirement that the employees and anyone related 
you know, they have to have these on them while in the yard. You know, this is a, um, a requirement. So anyway, they pull up into the parking lot of the building, which had this amazing view of the bay. And he said, like, you know, it was like a, a it could be a painting of the ocean. It was so good. And while they were waiting for, you know, her brother's shift to end, they just began to stargaze and bullshit back and forth about this and that and the other thing. And the both of them um, just happened to be believers in various forms of paranormal phenomenon and uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theories. So while they were there talking about all these different things and looking at the stars, and, you know, this is a really good night for this, they were also discussing their own paranormal experiences. And between the both of them, you know, he said they probably have enough uh, tales to keep Paranormal Witness going for an extra seven seasons. So I'm guessing they got a lot of stories. Uh, so anyway, as the discussion continued, they both happened to notice something just out of the ordinary in the skies above them. And it was Madeline who first pointed out that this ball of gold light had just popped out of nowhere. It was just absolutely weird. And before, you know, John began to say, like, holy shit, this is a UFO, he began to think back on the fact that back in the town where he used to live, there was a landing strip for aircraft. So at first, he began thinking, you know, this might be a helicopter of some kind or an airplane. But then it just began to move about in the sky in ways neither of those things would move. And this is one of those things that I think most of us notice when we see a UFO it just it moves weird and so anyway um you know he he's watching this thing in the sky and he said the entire time this thing was silent and it was just moving strange and he said the object you know it, it made no noise there was no flashing nothing just this ball of golden light streaking across the sky in ways that he don't think he's ever seen before not even from you know living 10 minutes away from a landing strip so this thing was just so fluid in its movement that it seemed unreal. And the entire encounter, he believes, lasted for anywhere between two and four minutes total. And after that time had passed, this gold-like craft just stopped in the middle of the air. Less than a minute passed by before they looked at one another and they had that, you know, that thing that always happens. You saw that, right? Like you saw. I'm not crazy. You saw that. Everybody abruptly stops and then everybody looks at one abruptly another. is like, yeah. "Oh my god!" <laughs> right? And so uh, they have this moment, and uh, a few minutes passed when you know this craft that had been in the sky. They noticed that this thing is now in the water, underneath the water, and it was similar to how the light had appeared in the sky. Just a ball of gold light that appeared out of nowhere, except by the time he saw it again, here it was underwater. And this encounter only lasted a few seconds before speeding away beneath the waves. And after this encounter, they just began to try and make sense of the light being underwater now. Like, how the hell did this happen? And every time they tried to make sense of it, they found themselves not being able to articulate it. It was just bizarre. And yet, awesome. And, you know, John goes on to say that this wasn't his first encounter with a UFO. Um, you know, he had had several encounters before this one, but not like this. You know, so a few minutes go by, and he's gotten brackets here, and not trying to sound racist here, so I don't know what's coming after this. Don't get mad at me if this is racist somehow. <laughs> um, he's, he said, this black guy just appeared from nowhere behind us. And he said, this dude was absolutely scary as fuck. You know, he looked like he was in his 30s. He was built like a professional wrestler. And he says, think like Triple H or The Rock. Um, and this guy began asking them questions about, you know, why were you there? And Madeline responded with how she had a visitor's pass to be there and was waiting for her brother who was working inside the building. And it was like something out of a movie or a TV show, John says, because this guy who... You know, she's sworn she's never met before, was calling her by her first name, and him too. He knew his name, and he never met this guy before. Like, he already knew who these people were. And John said he asked, uh, you know, he asked him for the visitor's pass that she had on her and began telling her that the pass she had was invalid and he did not recognize the first letter or last name on the pass. 
And she tried arguing back and forth with him for a bit that if it wasn't valid, there was no goddamn way that, you know, they'd be allowed to park in that spot in the first place. And when asked his name or anything similar, he just refused to give it to them. He'd only say that he was the manager on duty or MOD, MOD, uh, manager on duty. So when he asked how he knew we were, um, you know, like, or fuck, I fucked that up too. They asked him how they, you know, how this guy knew who they were. And you know, apparently he just skirted around the whole issue, um, you know, repeatedly. And after a while, you know, they just gave up trying to get information from this guy. And, um, but despite this, John said that he was making thinly veiled references to things in the sky and then began saying he was worried for us because, and he quotes this, it's a Friday night, got no idea what kind of yahoos are out there on the road at night. Right? I mean, this is something you see often, uh, usually with the men in black, is these thinly veiled threats when you see something that you're not supposed to see. It's kind of like, you know, you guys talk and you're done. So this whole encounter kind of made John's heart just drop into his chest. And he said it wasn't until Chris, now this is the brother, the janitor that was working inside, um, when he came out and asked what was going on, um, that the manager actually said that he was just chatting with them. And he asked uh, Chris, you know, if he had known those, you know, John and his girlfriend Madeline. And he said yes. And he said, uh, you know, this guy claims he's the manager or whatever. And Chris just nodded and explained this whole situation to him. And the monitor just said, just told him to make sure they followed the rules and protocol of the shipyard. And so then the three of them drove home in silence, just wondering if whether or not his comment about yahoos on the road was some kind of threat towards them that they'd be run off the road. And he remembers spending the entire night just panicked that some other vehicle would crash into them and kill them. And he said there were several times on the way back that it seemed like a car would just collide with them, you know. But after arriving home, they just, you know, I guess that wasn't what was going to happen. So um, John decided to stay. He crashed on, it crashed on Madeline's couch that night because you know, he was too freaked out to go home. And the next day, uh, she dialed a number on the back of the pass she had. So this is the, the parking pass that she had. There was a number on the back. She calls the number to ask about this mod, you know, this guy, this manager that they spoke to the night before and questioning about how this card was invalid. And afterwards, she was told by the person on the phone that her pass was not invalid and asked how he would know just by looking at it and that the whole thing just sounded insane. So she didn't say anything about the light in the sky and underwater, um, you know, to the person on the phone. And John even asked Chris a few days later about the manager. And he basically sat him down and said that he'd never seen this guy. In fact, his actual manager was a scrawny old Hispanic man. And not this uh, mid-30s uh, big-built black guy who looked more fit to be in a, you know, a wrestling ring. When he asked if they were transferring the old manager for a new one, the current guy told him he had no idea what he was talking about, that he and Chris were apparently the only two on duty that night, and basically this this guy that was there, you know, the manager on duty, nobody knows who the hell he was or what he was doing there. So um, that was interesting. You know, I, is that the, this guy was just staking out the joint, or what, you know, is this how they do it? Like he, he works here, but not on the books. Well, right. You know, I, I've I've come to a, I don't know. I wouldn't want to say a belief or, or a decision, but I'm, I'm definitely leaning more these days that pretty much everything that we're seeing, maybe not everything, but most of what we see in the night sky in terms of UFOs are, I believe, man-made. I I I, I definitely. Um, have come to ascribe the majority of these sightings to what we, I guess, what has been called the um, breakaway civilization. I, I really starting to believe that. Well, believe is a strong word. I'm definitely le leaning that way. So do you think that in cases like this, I mean, the reason why there's deniability and there's a, an effort to cover it up is that they, you know, they're they're basically 
uh, either military craft that, you know, obviously they don't want their enemies um, getting wind of or how they work or whatever, or do you think that is just... It, there's something more going on that they just don't want the public to know about, whether that's weaponizing space or that's... Um, you know what you know, I think the real issue is, and it's the saddest part of all this, is that they're, they're not scared about people knowing about electrogravitic technology or anti-gravity technology. They're scared... Like, that. that's a principle that is somewhat understood. Um, there have been leaked documents that seem to indicate that at some point, I'm not sure if it was Lockheed Martin or Boeing, um, was actually petitioning the government to declassify electrogravitic technology so that they could begin using it commercially. The problem is, it is powering this kind of technology. Right, the power sources for something that you would, you know, the 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 source of energy that you would need to power a device like an anti gravity you can't sell spaceship. It. Well, I I mean the world's economy is based on oil. Fuck the American dollar is called the petrodollar. <laughs> right, uh, it, it it's it's very and, important that that remains strong. Look at what's going on right now in the world, right? And that yeah. and that's true also for the medical field, right? Like I mean, they probably got a dozen different How many times have we come across an article that hey, we've cured cancer. Here here's exactly how to do it. Um and of course it never comes out, right? I mean, oftentimes either there's just a, a silence after it or, you know, the the doctor or the scientist is dead. Well, very and much so. All these things are industries. But with oil, I think it's, it's even bigger than that because there's a certain level of control. Um, the people who have controlled the energy, who have controlled the, um, the, you know, the energy source of this planet for the last hundred years... Um, have been in control of, of politics and have basically become power brokers and taken away their energy, right? I mean, it's even a political tool, right? Do what we want or we'll starve you of oil and then your people will freeze to death and you, your cars won't work. You know what? I have to say I, I agree with you. Like, when you break it all down, it's like the whole world, every little bit of every bit of power, every bit of control, it all revolves around money. And when it comes to money, you know, your main, I guess your your main investments are, you know, oil. You know, it's resources. It's um, resources that are universally needed, um, that are, they're non-renewable. So making, making electrogravitic technology... Of publicly available, that's really not going to cause immediate ripples in the the, the, the fabric of the economy um, worldwide. But introducing the accompanying power source for that would probably make the world's economy crumble. There's yeah. there's no there's no system set up right now to easy, easily trans uh, transition over. Um, it really does look like that experimentation with this technology began in, you know, the 30s or 40s. Um, there's indications that flying machines in general have been, you know, the, the cutting edge of technology for going way back. There's a whole uh, slew of airships, uh, sightings of, of weird airships back before... Uh, uh, zeppelins were a big thing and and you know the long before the wright brothers um i think it was in the late 1800s there's you know all these you can look it up i can't remember what it's called but it's it's a whole slew of of airship uh, mystery, uh mysterious airships um and then i think that those who have been kind of behind the scenes working on this stuff uh, whatever you want to call them, the Illuminati or or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, they've been working on this stuff since then. You know, a, a, a well-funded group of of intelligent, you know, elites. So they've been working on this stuff for a hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years. How long? How far back? 
does the tradition go? I don't know. Um, but it definitely looked like in in Germany in the 40s, uh, in the 30s and 40s, they began experimenting with real electrogravitic anti-gravity technology. And out of that came, I mean, the Americans discovered uh, um, how to split the atom. Um, all this cutting-edge research was going on. And now, in today's world, we're just absolutely inundated with UFO sightings, UFO sightings. And the CIA has admitted, openly admitted, to planting fake UFO stories in countries where they were flying spy planes. Yeah, well, I mean, that makes sense. But, I mean, like you said, um, UFOs have been, you know, a part of our culture, really, um, since, like, the I don't know if, if it was the 50s or... I know it was big in the 70s. Um, but let me ask you this. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> a lot of people look at Roswell, you know, the, the whole thing that happened there is the beginning of... Uh, you know, in fact, where we get some of our technology, right? Whether mm-hmm. that's uh, PCB, um, uh, LED lights, uh, you know, the the computer as we know it, you know, kind of came from there with PCB and, and stuff like that. Um, and possibly anti-gravitics. So, you know, what do you think of that? I mean, do you think that's where well, it started? Well, there's actually, there's actually an alternate train of thought on that. Okay. And it's that that crash was not extraterrestrials at all. That, in fact, the crash was a German test flight. And you think that's why, like, the uh, Americans were so quick to grab that out of there? <laughs> you know? Well, of course. If, you're, if, if a country that, I mean, at the time, um, if Germans had that kind of technology flying over your country and you had a chance to get your hands on it of course you'll get your hands on it um there you know again there's there's so much misinformation around roswell that what would have been scarier at the time that a a air an advanced aircraft um beyond anything that that the allies had at the time, had just crashed in New Mexico, um, carrying Nazi Germans, or that uh, the rumor of space aliens made its way around. True. Right. But uh, let me ask you this. I mean, let's say that that's the case. Let's say that, uh, you know, the, the UFOs and things like that in general that we see now are like government or military or even private sectors. Uh, let, let's say that's the case. I mean, if you look back thousands of years, and there's paintings and caves and stuff like that that um, obviously show what appears to be a UFO in it, then, you know, you, you start to question, I mean, do you think well, that... Um, that's where many people believe that um, that the, these various well-funded groups through history, these these hidden inventors... Um, whether they were Nazis or Illuminatis or, you know, it was probably a, a, a groups of all of them it, all over the world searching through ancient cities. Hitler funded the most, um, the most comprehensive and expensive search for Atlantis that has ever been put forward in, in the history of man. They were all over all kinds of ancient sites. And I would not be surprised. And I'm the the US military has been accused of the same thing. Just, you know, during the Iraq war. There was are stories coming out of there that um they were all over these old Sumerian sites excavating, taking artifacts. The, the, there is a school of thought that believes that that in in the past either extraterrestrials or human beings had discovered this technology in the past that humanity is far older than 
what we currently believe it is. And as a result, there are these little, <clears throat> excuse me, these little bits and pieces of technology um, buried beneath our feet in, in ancient tombs and, and whatnot. Well, that that's the theory that I actually find really interesting is that, you know, with your ancient cities like Atlantis and stuff like that. Atlantis, Lemuria. Lemuria. And what I find interesting, um, you know, because everybody talks about aliens having visited. I mean, you know, we just did a thing with uh, the Anunnaki and all this stuff. There are, there are theories like that for sure. But at the same time, I'm very interested by the idea that, uh, you know, this theory that humans had, like you said, come across how to create this technology. Like they, they've reached a peak, I guess, of or uh, that we've reached here on Earth. And they always destroy themselves and pockets of humans survive in different areas and then they have to build civilization all over again but we keep repeating the mistakes of the past where we get into this well that's that's very much a possibility when when you hear uh michio kaku talk about type zero type one type two civilizations which is actually just a you know he he didn't come up with that some other scientists came up with that um but when he talks about these different types of civilizations there's these events that separate them. These events that we have to go through before we get to type 1 or type 2 or type 3. And they're called the Great Filter Events. And it's, it's theorized that in order for a civilization to get to a type 1, like get from where we are to a type 1, that there will be certain milestones that we'll have to hit. And those milestones, not, not milestones... But these these uh, hurdles that could, in essence, be a huge filter in which if we don't pass through the filter, which means we've exterminated ourselves back to a Stone Age again. And I, I, I've given this a lot of thought. Now, think about this for a moment. Um, at one point in time in man's history, the maximum amount of energy that a single human being could harness... Um, would be that stored in a log of wood, right? So you you light the, the log on fire, it burns, it releases its energy, you can cook food, you can keep large predators at bay, you can burn down a forest. It's actually a pretty powerful force. Um, so you fast forward that, and we start developing things like technology and machines and so you take a car or a a backhoe we'll say and with comparatively little fuel you get a huge amount of energy that you can expend in digging a big hole or you know a backhoe could easily tear down a house or a building and destroy a bunch of cars you know how much destruction could a backhoe do before it ran out of gas so to get to a type type one type two type three civilization we're looking at extent like look at how much power you have at your fingertips right like it, it coming into your you know your your car your all the electricity you as an individual you have access to so much energy it's crazy. So now how will the human in a type 2 civilization, how much energy is he going to have available? Well, each individual person is going to have like the equivalent of a nuclear bomb powering their homes and their various devices and their transportation, right? That's just how it scales up. Now, you know, <clears throat> you just think, well, you know, I need power for my UFO, and I need power for, for for my replicator device, and I need power for my home cloning machine, and my quantum, uh, you know, my my quantum computer and my teleportation devices. So, an individual in the future is going to have access to a ridiculous amount of power. Now, the more power you give an individual, the greater the chance of of somebody going off their rocker. And using that power in a in a bad way, it becomes more volatile. It's more, uh, you know, for someone to to do a, a a crazy act with a little bit of power, 
is not so detrimental to everybody. As yeah, a guy so. with a torch and a guy with a nuke. Although, <laughs> one time in Battlefield, I did kill someone with a blowtorch. It took like three or four minutes. He must have felt like an idiot. But anyway. Anyway. Um. <laughs> the, the, the point I guess I'm trying to make is that there's these events that we call great filter events. And it could very well be the case that we had built ourselves up as a civilization and we failed to pass through one of these great filter events. Now, it could be that we've done that multiple times um, or it could be that we've just, we've really just did it the one time. You know, who, who at, at this point, it's, it's very difficult to tell. Um, but, you know, when we look back at all of our old stories, in India, you have the flying Vamanas that the gods flew around in, um, the Anunnaki and, and their f various uh, flying devices, um, the uh, Eric Von Donneken's chariot of the chariots of the gods. Uh, there's, there's so many allegories to ancient flying technology. And we always equate it with with this great power, you know, this, this godlike power. And even today, in the 21st century, we have the same thing. We just, we, instead of being gods, we call them aliens. And they have this amazing flying power that, while we can fly, we, we can't fly like a UFO can. Um, I, I would just submit that it's very possible, at least in my mind, that either through just hard work and discoveries or through archaeological discoveries um the the very top tier elite have created various flying devices electrogravitic i i mean it means it, it it would mean a whole pile of things a super advanced form of energy um an anti-gravity device because of the way it moves it would almost certainly need um oh what do they call it a a um a, a way to dampen the the g-force or something like that yeah I'm, I'm trying to remember the proper name for it now and it's totally escaping me <clears throat> but you you need a way to basically kill inertia that's what it is kill the inertia inside of the craft so that when you made that quick 90 degree angle turn at you know, you Mach into four, a, a, a can of spaghetti. Also. Yeah, everybody didn't wasn't liquefied on the opposite wall. Um, so there's there, there's a whole variety of technologies that that may be linked to this. That for obvious reasons, now that we've talked about the great filter events, um, you really don't want some crazy guy strapping a UFO power packed to his chest and you know well, uh, hell i don't even trust half the people with guns i mean i think everybody should be allowed to have one well no i just did an <laughs> ironic statement I, how about this <laughs> i i think that it i think that a regular person should be able to have a gun to protect themselves i just think that people should be i don't know screened before you get it because there's an awful lot of fucking loony bins well there are there's all kinds of, but i mean of course that's a that's a whole other hot button issue. It is. So let me ask you this: What about the physical properties, um, you know, of an underwater UFO? Because uh, that, I mean, something that flies and can go underwater and and seemingly uh, move about in the same way. I mean, I, it, I I don't think there would be any. I mean, material sciences. It just like like in the public material sciences have come so far um, that I'm sure black budget material science has developed materials that can withstand, you know, crushing depths um, along with, with take, take the heat and take the cold, take the pressure, you know, uh, scratch resistant, the whole nine yards. I, I, I'm sure they have this technology. And if, if electrogravitic, uh, aircraft or spacecraft or craft, whatever the hell you want to call it, operate by manipulating gravity, um, then the medium that you're in wouldn't really matter. 
whether it's water or space or air. If your if if the skin of your craft could take the pressure and could take the heat and and the friction, then I I don't think it would impose any problems um, to a craft that's moving around by manipulating gravity. You know the interesting thing about flying. <clears throat> Is that when compared to the concept of transporting, like, you know, you could open a portal. Um, even that seems kind of old, right? And then you, when you look at the future, you look at how you could travel long distances like that. It, it doesn't seem like, you know, I mean, you have that problem with the going faster than the speed of light. But just to get somewhere like that it would almost seem like you would have to, like, open up a whole you know, compressed space, and almost like a, a piercing through the ear, um, just shoot through one end and out the other. Um, an Einstein-Rosen bridge. An Einstein-Rosen bridge. Um, so, like, I Wormhole. mean... Wormhole. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know those terms, but I'm just agreeing with you because I know that you, you know what you're talking about. Um, so, Very you know, scientific of you. It, it's very sci... Well, I mean, I'm no scientist, but... Uh, you know that that's what it seems like to me, um, and I mean when you look at the future in general. And, well, maybe we're not there. That's why all the craft are all you always see them in the sky because they got nowhere <laughs> else to fucking go, right? Yeah, well, that could be. I mean, the, the thing I find interesting. I mean, when you look at the supposed alien um, interviews and stuff like that, and, and you know encounters that people have with aliens, and you know they seem to speak from a uh, a telepathy like way. Or speak via telepathy. And the other thing they seem to have is this hive mind, right? It's like they all have this hive mind. And, it, it, you know, you couple that in with the idea of being able to, um, you know, go through portals and just appear here and appear there. And, and it all starts to feel like uh, quantum physics, where you can be everywhere at once, you know. Everybody knows, every, like, everything. Well, a possible. hive mind makes perfect sense to me. I think in a in a post singularity society, so in society that gets to a point where it creates um, super AI, and at that point you can just go back to being a dummy because the super AI, it, it, as long as you build it in such a way where it doesn't want to obliterate you, exterminate you, if you could build a a super intelligent um general ai is what they call general ai if you could build one that had human level a human level general ai it will begin developing technologies you know at such a rate that we can't we can't predict the effects that it would have on society that's what we refer to as a singularity we can't see beyond it so i think that if and when we reach that point it's very likely that people will begin uh, interfacing their their brains with a, a global internet. You'll ha you si it'll simply start off with you having some simple devices implanted in your brain, so that you can you know Google things just by thought, and by extension, the internet becomes the new the new layer to your brain. You know you can call it a neocortex. Um, our brains can't get any bigger or women will die. Um, it, we, we're literally at the physical evolutionary limitation uh, unless women's lower halves begin to change. <clears throat> we're, we're at the limit for our brain size. So the next jump up is probably going to be um, aided with technology. And I think that's the first bits we're going to see of that is going to be an, a certain interfacing with the internet. I mean, the internet is a is an amazing archive. Um, I would imagine in the future it may be cleaned up a little bit <clears throat> and and archived a little better. Um, but you know, ultimately, you with people, you, could you imagine? Well, uh, if you fast forward, I mean, you, you fast forward even beyond that, and the internet... You know, supposedly, if we were all hooked into it, you know, we were all in these pods. We're, we're in the matrix, as it were. Um, it almost seems as if the internet becomes this giant, um, you know, brain tissue. This this giant communication system that um, 
we basically are like cells in a body, you know, just transferring, uh, doing our little bit for the giant, you know, the giant body that we're connected to. Well, I, I don't know. The Matrix, of course, showed us a very particular kind of a, of, of a matrix. One where we were, we went in there unwillingly and were enslaved and were being used as a power source. Now, that's ridiculous. It was a great movie. It's ridiculous <laughs> for various reasons. But I think that the, the creation of something like that is very likely. Um, and it may indeed, the technology to do this stuff may already exist. It's, it's basically just very high resolution brain scanning equipment. And our brain scanning equipment has has jumped up in resolution like crazy over the last uh, five years. Uh, and I think it's only going to continue on that trend. And maybe in some of these black vaults, there are, there are the technology to do what we're talking about already exists. But it, one of the arguments for why we haven't seen or heard from E.T. yet, um, it, it, if indeed you ascribe to that theory, or if, why the sky isn't teeming with aliens, is because most of them abandon outer space for inner space. That once they discover how to upload their minds into um, the digital world, that they just create vast computer networks, build the, you know idealized digital paradises for themselves um, and they live out the rest of their civilization's existence in these virtual environments. I kind of understand, like I can understand it, but I can see, you know, I can't see a civilization continuing to live if everybody didn't, you know, know how to, um, I guess, do the fundamentals to keep it running, you know, the, the maintenance, the, the know-how. But... You know, well, that's I, why you build super advanced AI and robots that maintain that stuff on the outside. But what happens when someone goes rogue and puts a virus in it? Well, that's, you know, if you have a computer the size of a moon, one or two viruses probably aren't going to hurt. Mm. Right. The, 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 the level of technology we're talking about is up with, you know, type 1, type 2 civilization levels. But... It's it's not as far away as, as as people think, you know. UFO technology seems exotic and strange and weird, but only because, in in my opinion, the the cutting edge, real bleeding edge of technology, has been constantly being hidden, at least at the very least for the last fifty sixty years. And, uh, you know, we see little bits of that trickle out in the way of GPS and infrared and, you know, uh, 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 the, the silicon chip and Whatever they optics. need to keep the, uh, the economy running, <laughs> right? Well, I mean, one. you know, I, I'm sure some of these scientists got to make a turn a buck at some point. Yeah. Right. Like, well, we can't let you talk about the UFOs, but we'll we'll Here's let you pretend case. we'll let you pretend that you made you invented fiber optics. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just I'm just spitballing. But well, I mean, it the, seems the, very likely to me. It 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 seems like the big push forwards. Um, you know, it really is this digital um, this digital recreation thing. I mean, uh, we we've been pushing graphics since like what the Commodore 64 the old Apple computers or whatever and I mean that you know it got so far with your Nintendo and your Super Nintendo and then you went 3D well computers went 3D first with like Wolfenstein and Doom and then you know you had your Nintendo 64 and your PlayStation and then they got further with that but I mean the biggest breakthrough I guess uh, is really only happening recently is with the virtual reality like the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. Which has been around right. for years. The technology has been around forever. But it's finally gotten to the point, and, and I use the term loosely here, but that is affordable enough <laughs> that people can buy it. Because well, it's, it's become commercial. Well, yeah. let, let, let me illustrate this to you. Here, here's an idea you probably haven't thought of. Um, we have been working on virtual reality for thousands of years. Okay, explain. Okay. So, what do you think the inside of your house is? 
It's virtue, right? When you make when 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 man first bulldozed the forest and then planted trees and, and made a little garden in an artificial pond. What was oh, he? Yeah, for right. Sure. I mean, we've been making our own virtual reality. We're like, you know what? Nature sucks at building comfort, so we're gonna build houses. We're gonna build. I mean, look at like Japanese Zen gardens and shit like that. Those it's something that you'd never find in nature. It's so so beautiful and 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 creative. So it's it's amazing. So why wouldn't people? put themselves inside of an environment where you're basically a god because anything you think or will can happen and you can just create the most idealized environment that you could imagine that's a good point i mean i play games you know to, to quote uh, american dad the thing about real life is is it often sucks so you know you play these games and you can be whoever you want exactly you so if given the opportunity why would why wouldn't people or at least a certain a certain segment of the population decide that they want to spend eternity living in a self-built paradise where they're basically a god true yeah i can't see any many people turning that down i mean the older so that's folk. Uh, you know i think for me that's probably one of the strongest arguments for the the the, uh, the fermi paradox in other words who gives a shit if it's not real it's better well, the, it, it, real is is subject, subjective, isn't it? I mean, it if 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 reality is just a bunch of neurons firing in your brain, and I mean, people argue right now that we're living in a simulation. That's true. We just and did people a podcast say, on that. well, if we are, so what? I love, I feel, I hurt. That's makes, all real to me. What it difference makes you does it think make? about the? Uh, the villains you put in these games that are fodder, right? That you know are going to be killed, that nobody's going to lose against. And like every time someone plays, ah, fuck this again, I'm going to get shot in the face. It's like just doom because they must feel it. I mean, they're programmed to be like, ah, right? So <laughs> I can feel pain, but have I been programmed to love? Yeah, it's kind of like what was it, The Simpsons? Why have I been programmed to feel pain? Right? <laughs> the robots on fire. But I mean, um. <laughs> Totally, right? I mean, I play games now um, because they're more interesting than real life. I mean, real life, what do you do? You get up, you go to work. Why does anybody even listen to this podcast or other podcasts like it? It's because, you know, regular life is boring. That's why people go to media. It's because every day means you get up, you do repetitious shit at work so that you can you know, live, you can buy your food, you can pay for your rent or your house or your mortgage, your car, so you can get back and forth to work, and then you have a little bit of leftover money that you can use to enjoy on frivolous shit. Um, so you're really living for those moments when you can... Moments order, of escape. Moments of escape. You, you basically trade 40 hours a week for, what, 10 or 12 hours of leisure? And that sounds like a pretty bad deal. When you put it like that, doesn't well, it? Well, it's better, it's better than how people had it in the Dark Ages. True, because it was dark. I, I mean, literally, the common man, <laughs> the lowest common man, you know, these or the average common man these days um, has access to better services than a, than a king in the 12th century. Yeah, but I still want equal. I, I, I still want equality. submit that I don't want to work. <laughs> I submit that I don't want to work and I want to be paid for. You know what I see in the future? This is what I see. I mean, we're talking about like people being used as a battery and, and the whole idea of going into this virtual reality where everything is great. So I see in the future, like as, as soon as you're able to understand, maybe they'll just like poke a chip in your head when you're a baby so that you can, you know, you're smart enough to understand the concept and make a choice. And you could be like, okay. I will dedicate to your great system the battery life of my body, and for the rest of my life, I'm just going to be in this virtual reality. Yeah, but so see, it doesn't work because your 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 brain needs the energy that you would produce. That's why Matrix is ridiculous. There's there's a whole re there's a whole pile of reasons why that won't work. What but if they fed you beans? And like, I mean, Japan is doing wonderful things with running cars on shit. <laughs> <laughs> sure. That, but, that's a thing, you, man. The power that you would use to run a brain to experience those things would be what it would need to run. 
so you couldn't take any out of the system. You're you're not uh, you're not netting any more power. But, but could, could re- somebody re- do it? Could it, is it possible for a sign? You know, can science solve that problem? Can science solve that problem? I I think at the end of the day, that stories like this and well, this story and and stories like this illustrate that there may in fact be another tier of society who may in fact have access to weird and wonderful, strange technologies that to to us sound like science fiction way off in the future, um, but may in fact be a reality that we're living side by side, the i.e. breakaway civilization. And it could very well be that, that this WWE wrestling looking um, guard or or manager um, is is a member of just such a society and is tasked with maintaining the border between us and them. Do you know what I find interesting? <clears throat> the movie Demolition Man, which came out like probably twenty years ago or more, that movie had so many things in it like you know because it was a futuristic movie that ended up coming true i mean there there's aspects in that that were we're still not there yet but we're on the road there like driving cars right i mean we got um self-driving google, cars you mean yeah self-driving cars we got google at it we got um tesla it, tesla we got uh, apple um you know like big companies are they're really trying to do this thing we had you know they had um um computers everywhere right uh they had monitors that would follow like webcams and stuff i mean that was way before this was a thing the government right? that listened to you on the street the government that listened to you on the street uh yeah like the 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 swearing thing you you swore it would give you a ticket right we're we're almost there i mean they're trying to censor the internet and we got uh they had arnold as president was referenced in there and while he didn't become president he did become governor i mean there was just a lot of uh things in there that like cryogenically freezing somebody right uh that's a thing like you if you want you can sign up for that so that you know hopefully in the future they hope they'll have a cure and they can unfreeze you yeah right so i mean except the way they do it now destroys every cell in your body no you're doomed you're just giving money away right it's like here just Take my money, right? But I mean, isn't that nuts? I mean, that little fucking movie had so many things in it that you know either happened or are happening or we're on the roadmap to. That you know at the time seemed completely made up for that movie. It's it it definitely definitely illustrates our ability to um, project out and. Information technology is probably, while it's one of the most complicated things that we've ever devised as human beings, as far as we know, um, on public record, at the same time, it's, it's relatively easy. There's, there there are, are sound ways already developed for projecting information technology. Um, and if you're interested in that, I, I would suggest looking into the works of Ray Kurzweil. Uh, Kurzweil. He wrote, um, oh, what, did, what was it called? The Singularity, I think it was called. He wrote a couple of different things. So he's a futurist and goes into many of the, or some of the topics that we touched, in, uh, touched on here tonight. Well, um, I think that's a, a good idea for everybody, I guess. Um, yeah, so I mean, underwater UFOs. It's a hell of a thing. <laughs> like an hour or two. So, so summarize, it's a hell of a thing. Um, but yes, I where I don't know where I was going with that. If anybody is wondering where I, I've been off my rocker a little bit here, it's because I've had no sleep all week. Um, and, I, and I'm having a couple drinks here, so I'm just a little bit, uh, a little bit t- uh, you know, but uh, anyway, that being said, we are doing some pretty kick-ass Halloween shows. Cause I think we've, you know, we've gone through this topic. We, you know, we've got to cover as far as I think we're going to take it tonight. Um, but we do have some really cool Halloween stuff coming. We're not going to miss that. 
So uh, tune in to that. And um, I'm just going to throw this out here. I should have mentioned this when we started it, but if any of you guys would be interested in a live stream, you know, a special Halloween live stream, like maybe not on Halloween day, but you know, like we'll tell you ahead of time, um, and it'll be Halloween centric. If you guys would be interested in that, uh, give us a shout out in the comments because we're seriously looking at doing that as well as um, a couple shows we have planned. Um, you know, want to make some effort for Halloween for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, let us know and if you have an effed up story of your own and would like to get it into a podcast, you can submit that to us at effedupstories.com. That's the F-F-E-D-U-P-S-T-O-R-I-E-S.com. And thanks again, John, for your submission. Um, for everybody else who's got submissions and that aren't in or online yet, they are coming. They're being worked on as I say this. And um, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed the episode and hope you will tune in to our next ones coming soon. Good night, Thanks for everybody. listening, everybody. Have a good night. Good night.